now my pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker. Jeff Brugman has worked in over 30 countries helping city governments, global companies, and international institutions develop their next practices for sustainable development. From 1990 to 2000, Jeb served as founding secretary general of ICLEI, which is a local governments for sustainability, today the largest international association of city governments. As founding partner of the next practice in 2004, he has worked most recently with companies such as Barclays, BP, and Thomson Reuters to design award-winning and high-impact new product and business lines. His latest book is Welcome to the Urban Revolution, How Cities Are Changing the World. And I had the opportunity to speak briefly with Jeb over breakfast this morning, and I was really impressed by his ability to connect practices uh, on a local level, on a large-scale level, with economics. And I'm greatly looking forward to, to having him expand on both his experiences and his vision for the future. Please welcome Jeb Brugman. Thank you very much, Andrew. I appreciate the introduction to, into Thomas for inviting me to speak with you this morning. It's a tremendous uh, honor when Thomas and I had our first phone conversation about this presentation. Basically, it boiled down to big ideas, big vision. We need to launch uh, the next 10 years of our practice here in Canada. And when I started to think about what are the big ideas that are still big ideas to you, I found it rather intimidating. Because, in fact, you have been, over the last 10 years, you have been the proof of the concepts behind the big ideas. In fact, now what's happening, and I think as Thomas and the other speakers have said this morning, your practice, your proof in the market is actually leading the concept, is leading the big ideas thinkers. So I want to applaud you tremendously at 10 years of tremendous momentum, and we're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. But before doing so, ask you to think back 10 years ago, think back to 2003, and Thomas sort of touched on this. And ask yourself, remind yourself, if you went to the office one morning to your team in 2003 and said, we need to make a lead gold standard building part of the core work that we do, whether we're in a design firm or a, firm or a property firm, how many of you, and I'd like to ask you to raise your hands, how many of you would have received a response like that was weird, impractical, on business-like, perhaps even on viable. Think back 10 years. Lead gold standard, we need to do it. Raise your hands. Was that a weird idea? How about lead platinum? 2003, you went to your office and said, let's do lead platinum, particularly in the private sector. That was weird stuff. And I think it's very important as we think about how far we can go over the next decade, over the next 20 or 30 years, to deal with problems of the scale that Thomas has presented to us this morning. To ask ourselves, what do we learn from this last 10 years and the momentum we've built into in it about how we measure a real business opportunity, how we make the case to our team when we go back after this conference that we have a real business opportunity in doing something bigger and bolder? And what do we learn about what is required for us to scale that and achieve it rapidly within the context of business as we do it today? So to do that and to start with this big idea point of view, I want to put this whole issue of optimization and the momentum towards optimization of which you and we are a part. I have been in my career mostly part of that momentum from the local government side, your partner in property development, you from the private sector side and the design side. We have to understand what's going on in the planet in terms of this curve here. That we're still on a cycle of revolutionizing the way we organize and design Earth. It's not just about how we design individual assets. We are reorganizing the global system, whether it's ecology or it's economics or the way that society happens still between now and 2050, where we'll reach a global population of 9 billion people, 
nearly 7 billion of them urban residents. And that pressure, that path of reorganization, has been forcing over the last centuries a revolution in the way that our economies function and the way that we think about assets and the assets that we should invest in. So we go back a few centuries and land the property, the core thing upon which your industry is based, is a, a cultural habitat. It doesn't have a distinctive economic value as an industry. Industries evolve and we think that value and the optimization, optimization of value is securing soil or some kind of commodity, forests, gold, some other kind of material. And we develop a global economy around that. And then we start city building and optimization is securing a natural location where we can have a harbor or a port. So the city of Toronto is founded on the whole notion that city building is securing that harbor. The king secures the harbor, we build a city there to make sure the Americans don't take it away from us. And around that harbor, we develop more urban market economies. So people come in, industries evolve, markets evolve, and the property industry is born. And what has been optimization for the property industry during, let's say, the, from the early 1920s until green building in, let's say, the 1990s, has been primarily three things. How we convert green fields into urban land, right? and get our business margin off of that. That's been much of the profitability of the property sector. How we standardize our product, and how we manage the supply chain of that and scale it and increase our margins on it. So optimization, and then let, we can add a, a fourth one, how we increase the yield of that product. Optimization was about securing land, converting land, standardized product, maintaining a margin on a standardized product, and then increasing the yield of that product. And what you have done, where you have proven and driven the industry with your big ideas and your practice is to move to a whole other conception of what an urban asset is and what an urban location is and what the value is we secure from it. The value proposition is moving in the trade from standardized, scaled standardized production to customized, optimized assets and locations. And that is the revolution that you are driving and the revolution that in which I think the property people in the property industry win as we go forward. Optimization has been a process of customization and your capacity to rapidly and efficiently customize for particular user groups, for particular performance objectives, be it regenerative or sustainability or healthy or competitive, is what's driving the property industry globally, and it's driving it um, in two primary ways. And I'm going to speak about it this morning in the context of the notion of price performance. And otherwise, what you do every time you innovate is create a delta, a change in the price of a set of performance features that we can get as users, as tenants, and owners. You're driving down the price and increasing the performance. And every time you drive down the price per unit and increase the performance of what I get for a lower price, you are leading the industry. And that is at the heart of the difference between what is a bold idea of what we need to do to save the planet and what is a business opportunity. I'm gonna talk about that a bit at length this morning. Now, you're not the only people doing it. Everybody is doing it. This process of optimization and customization is happening at the bottom of the pyramid and it's happening at the top of the pyramid uh, for the big corporations that want to lead platinum building. In my book, Welcome to the Urban Revolution, I spent quite a bit of time studying what is now a relatively famous, the world's largest slum, Dharavi, in downtown Mumbai. This is, before the subprime crisis, this was among the most valuable property in central Mumbai from a real estate investment point of view. And for decades, large property companies and developers have been trying to relocate this slum, move people off of it, and find a way to increase the yields and generate value out of that prime central Mumbai location. And they have always failed. They have failed because the people who built that land out of a marsh and with limited capital, but with great ambitions, found a way to build that space that was customized to their needs in terms of performance and to their wallet, their ability to procure materials and maintain and rent that space. 
And so here you see one of the little manufacturing villages within Dharavi where a woman uh, and her village are manufacturers of pottery. It is co-located with the main street, so it has direct access to the market. The manufacturing is there, people are living there, the creche is there, the healthcare center there, the social institutions are there. There are zero time and money costs for them to do anything in their life. And it's that optimization that makes Dharavi something both that they can hold on to because its price performance is so profound. They will go to the streets, they will go to war, they will cause a revolution to hold on to that space in spite of schemes. The property industry comes along with local government and they think, let's do what the property industry does. Let's increase yield. If we can increase yield for residential people and put them in this building, then we can find a way to get greater optimized value out of that asset. A total failure, why? Because the price is greater and the performance is lower. So people move into these buildings thinking that their proposition is better for them. In fact, they abandon the building and they go back and they secure a place in a shack in which they can do what they need to do in order to maintain their price structure as a family enterprise and to do their business and get those benefits from it. And this is where the solution is moving forward now in India and in slums around the world. Working with the design industry, working with the modular builders, now Tata is getting into modular housing construction so that you can drive down the cost of these units, designing customized locations for the lowest income people in the world that offer them profound price performance where they can still run their businesses in a safer way they did before, where they can live on a second, third, and fifth floor, and where they're optimizing yield of the location. So optimization is not just something that you're doing, for the purposes of saving the planet and greening the planet and increasing performance for your commercial tenants. It's something that's happening everywhere. It's also happening, for instance, in Silicon Valley, where this low density, tilt up development with lots of parking lots where Cisco and others were uh, established is being re-optimized in order to uh, attract talent, reduce their cost of using uh, of living and working in Silicon Valley and co-locating businesses together so that they can create synergies between them. So now in Silicon Valley with the commercial development industry uh, and the municipality of partnerships through a strategic planning process with the community where they're going to intensify North First Avenue, it's already taking place, you can go there, where they will co-locate residential amenities, retail and commercial office spaces for the main high-tech companies in North America, creating what they call innovation hubs. So the optimization trend is profound. It's something that's much bigger than what any of us are doing. It's driven by the fundamental revolution in geography that more and more as we globalize as an urban economic system, we will work to get more and more value uh, out of unique urban locations in order to achieve our economic strategies. And each of us as professionals and as individuals and companies, we step into this tremendous momentum of optimization that is a global phenomenon. And my little story here is that in 1990, as a do-gooder, I thought we should start getting municipalities around the world to take on the challenge of global climate change and sustainability. So here we are at the United Nations hosted by the UN Environment Program, the first meeting of local government leaders in the world hosted by the UN in the history of the United Nations, 400 city officials around the world. And what do we decide to do? We decide that in 1990, we should take on the problem of global climate change at the municipal scale. This is what was, talk about a weird idea. The science of climate change was still hardly something in people's awareness or reported in the press. Um, the word sustainable development, we are still, when we organizing this, when organizing this conference, we still were struggling to figure out how you translate it into French and Spanish and German. It was a new idea, it was an idea that no one understood. And at this meeting here, or that afternoon, in this picture, we decided to launch the first global research and development program of cities, 14 municipalities in Europe and North America, to figure out how you measure urban greenhouse gas emissions, how you benchmark it, you create a global standard around it, and you establish a process for urban, what we now call local climate action planning. And it was weird. At that date in 1990, Amsterdam that was in this meeting still did not treat the primary sewage going into the canals of that premium location in downtown Amsterdam. 
We were still the nuts and bolts, can we get the sewage to work? Can we select the solid waste? In Toronto, it was a big deal that you had blue bins put on your porch. That's where we were at in 1990, where we had a crazy idea. And where did it go over the course of a decade? So we organized with this group of municipalities. Metro Helsinki was one of them. And here you see you know, this very unique form of building, of urban of form, of a typology of buildings, these um, relatively uh, high volume, uh, intensified corridors. Uh, in the background, you see that Helsinki uh, Power Company uh, had pow did power production within the metro region a dirty, at dirty coal plants. So the question was, how do you optimize not just these buildings, but how do you optimize everything that you see within this picture? How do you optimize the metropolitan area? So back then, we thought we should approach this from an energy balancing point of view. So the first thing we did is, of course, looked at all the fuels going into the metro area as an energy system, all the conversion technologies employed in that, to measure the uh, output efficiency of a metropolitan region from an energy perspective. And then we had coefficient factors to translate all of those fuels and conversion factors into CO2 output, and that's what allowed us to create the first baseline analysis of urban CO2 emissions in metro areas uh, that were done in the world. What's interesting about this picture is in North America at that time, in any case, the general efficiency of a metro region or of a city in terms of uh, uh, application of uh, converted energy was, is about 30%. It was about 32%. It was lower for Metro Dade County, Miami at that time. And here you've got a relatively optimized metropolitan energy system already. In seven years' time, in making investments in public transit and developing and expanding a district heating system in doing fuel switching at this metro level, they were able to further optimize at a metropolitan scale 5% in seven years' time. So that was my first experience, that the process of optimization um, is something not only eminently doable, but that can be done rather rapidly if we then understand what the process is that makes it work on a market basis. And further proof in the pudding is here, I don't know if you can see these numbers in the back there, is the fact that municipalities around the world, now more than 500 municipalities around the world, have set increasingly ambitious targets for reducing their greenhouse gas emissions. So we started in the early 1990s with that program, the most ambitious ones, Portland, Oregon, 20% reduction by 2020, Toronto had a similar target. And now we have Chicago and Kansas City and Minneapolis in the United States setting targets of 80% reductions by 2050. Now, whether they have the leadership and they pull that off is a whole question that remains for us to see. But the issue is, is the fact that cities have moved in the period, in this instance, in the period of 10 years of time, just like you made this big move in a 10 year period of time from thinking about 20% being a stretch, actually thinking about doing anything about this as being weird and impractical, then 20% being a stretch, and then now thinking that it's viable to do 80%, again speaks to the fact that as the practice of optimization is something that uh, is extremely not only compelling from a policy perspective, but is viable from an economic one as well. We do this as individuals. And I draw a little arrow here to one of the people in the audience back there in 1990. His name is Hans Mörninghoff, and I'm going to tell a little tale narrative of Hans Mörninghoff and his evolution as an optimizer in the course of his career. Hans, at the time, uh, was the first environmental secretary of Hanover, Germany, one of the most advanced cities. They were in that urban uh, greenhouse gas reduction project with us. And back in the late 70s and 80s, Hans, like perhaps a lot of you, like myself, was on that weird fringe. Um, he was an engineer and obsessed with biogas and an anti-nuclear activist and one of the founders of the Green Party in, uh, in his state in Germany. And here he is out on the commune that he lived in in the late 70s and 1980s doing that weird stuff that was labeled alternative, right? Amory Lovins' alternative stuff, not mainstream, not something we should really aspire to if we are serious careerists and business people. And here he is with his friends um, in, his, in their dirty jeans, and they're in the hole there, and they're manufacturing proof of concept. We can do biogas as an urban energy source. Hans goes to our meeting. He's environment secretary. 20 years later, here's Hans, deputy mayor of Hanover, Germany. 
He's in charge of economic development, all of the hard services and planning and uh, uh, property development control, other things within the portfolio of departments within the city of Hanover. And here he is with his latest biogas plant. And also in 2000, um, leads the project of developing one of Europe's first real eco districts, the district of Kronzberg, Germany, um, and does so in an extremely inventive way, which I'll talk more about. Uh, but this is a district where the aspiration was to provide passive housing um, and net productive infrastructure in terms of creating district scale utilities that could actually export excess energy at a price point that was affordable for uh, lower income immigrants from Eastern Europe and Turkey at that time as rental housing. So that was the challenge target for price performance. And to get there, what they had to do, of course, is a lot of what you'd call internal optimization of the infrastructure and systems. So this is a big hot water storage tank that holds the water from all the passive solar panels in this precinct within the district. And so optimize the techno technological solution and also optimize the performance for that user group. So there's two elements to this all the time. How do you optimize the technical fix from a price and cost perspective? And how do you optimize the performance at the same time? That's the tank with the playground on top. And if you stand on top of that play playground, you look at the competitive asset uh, within Hanover, a 1970s rental apartment building that doesn't offer anything like the performance, um, but rents at the same price of what you can do to rent one of these passive solar houses with all of this great technology and green space around it within the Kronzberg district. This was done on a market basis. It requires oodles of innovations, and we could just pile pictures one after the other of the innovations there. You know how many innovations that are required. The key thing I want to highlight is the innovation is not just restricted to the technology, the materials, the HVAC systems, uh, it also involves innovation in policy, so you needed to create a building code that not only allowed but supported passive housing. And in fact, the engagement with industry that Hans led in Hanover actually created the passive housing development industry within northern, northern Germany. So the local builders who built these first prototype houses then became, began exporting that product around Germany itself. Innovation and procurement. So to drive an innovation process, you don't just sort of uh, do an RFP and create a partnership with one builder and one set of design technical service firms. They divided that piece of greenfield up into 20 different precincts and they created a kind of internal competition among all of them. So you have here really a laboratory testing a variety of technologies and mixes of technologies and ways of designing buildings for that user, uh, target user group. Um, so that you basically had a laboratory that was an industrial development strategy. And in order then to support people to use this stuff, especially if you, say, come from Turkey and the quality of the house you've had is dramatically different in all aspects to what you would have in live in in northern Germany, you need to innovate in how you engage the user community, how you train the users so they have to create a whole institution, innovate in institutional development in order to make sure that people can actually optimize the use of those buildings and at the same time develop as a community of new immigrants. So there's all kinds of innovations that we've all been involved with in order to achieve these things. And it's important to take stock, as I think Thomas has done a bit earlier, about where we've come and what the momentum is that we've created in order, before we try to address the issue in the next coming days, about what we should really aspire to and how we should measure um, what our ambition should be in the next de decades ahead. So in that tale, when we started, as I said, what we as city managers and city regulators and planners were doing was really just thinking about how to manage the end of the pipe. We were really in the waste management business, whether it was aqueous or air or, or solid waste. And that was our industry challenge at the time, how to reduce the footprint of our waste. And then we moved through the early 90s in this kind of story narrative that I've just presented to you to think about integrated planning. So we invented the whole field of urban sustainability planning in short order. Then we got into the business of innovative financing of retrofits, how to do re-engineer systems, you know, to uh, take parts of our solid waste and divert it into organic and produce biogas out of it. So we got into this whole eco-efficiency arena 
and we've been there, and Factor Four was published by Aaron Sorvik von Weizsäcker, and Amory Lovins came out with another book, and they decided Factor Ten efficiencies were achievable in the systems that we had in our cities already. And now, through your work, we're moving on to this net zero point of view. We're mainstreaming that idea. McKinsey comes out with a report for industry for large companies like IKEA, and IKEA is designing it, actually, and putting it in place, creating circularity in the waste cycles um, over the life cycle of their products. So, we, you know, IKEA that's also getting into housing development now will supply you with your furniture and your pillows, we will recover all the waste from it, we will resupply you with new stuff and we create a circular industrial system. So now we've gone into that net zero space. And as Thomas has said, the real discussion moving forward, and this is only in a 20 year period of time, has moved from thinking about how we manage cities as places in which we import resources extracted from nature at detriment to nature and manage those flows so we reduce our impact from pollution how we manage the stocks and cycle the stocks and cascade the reuse of materials within urban spaces and assets. And now we're thinking of the city as something entirely revolutionarily different, as a place that has ecological function, as a place that not only produces what it needs, but can actually export to other places outside of the urban space. And that is, that is dramatic. That is a revolutionary shift in the reconception of what a city is fundamentally. Bill Reese from UBC out here published a paper 20 years ago about the ecological footprint. And the premise of that paper is that the city is fundamentally non-ecological. It is a plague on the planet. And it, all it does is extracts and pleats nature. And there is no condition under which an urbanizing planet can become sustainable. And my guess is if Bill were here, he'd still argue that point of view. But where the practice is driving the concept, as I said earlier, where your discussions and your prototyping is driving what the big idea is, I think we're coming up with an entirely different reconception of the city. The city is a place which we can continue to optimize at different scales in order to create net primary productivity. And to me, it boils down to this. In my mind, this is kind of the mother of all metrics to share with you as a bunch of metrics wonks here this morning in terms of standards. Um, the market value of an optimization idea fundamentally driven by doing the innovations that allows you to drive down the total net cost for the user per unit, make it a square meter, and at the same time increase the performance that they get from it, the benefits they get from it. And you've innovated in this in dramatic ways. Um, but first, just to drill into that concept a little bit. In other words, optimization in a business sense is that practice of figuring out how to internally optimize the production process and the systems in the asset. So how do you create greater efficiency of space utilization so that you get greater rents? Um, uh, off of that space and reduce the cost for each user? How do you divide space not only into square feet, but divide it into hours of the day? There's a lot of innovation in that. How you do value engineering in your supply chain, moving from on-site construction, say, to scaled modular construction? How you do efficiency improvements in all of the equipment in the way that you manage and operate that building, driving down the total cost per unit? And at the same time, understanding for that user group for whom you're customizing so that they can secure that building or that location that allows them to achieve their greatest economic and social advantage that they seek in an urbanized global system. How do you add further value to them? And those who move that dot are the people who drive what comes next in the context of urban innovation. We can sort of boil it down. This is really simplified. There's all kinds of methods and things that you know and that people are innovating in themselves in order to understand that. But we need to re-clarify constantly what the performance priorities are for the user, right? So Andrew and I are talking earlier about what it is that's led to this mainstreaming of lead gold and plat platinum. We never thought when we got into it, you never thought, Thomas, when you got into it, that the proposition was fundamentally how you retain your talent, right? That talent retention is a core to the value proposition of doing uh, a, a green building. Um, and related to those performance standards, understanding what is the price sensitivity, but also innovating in what price is. 
So now you're thinking not just price, you're thinking about how to innovate in the financing of the space, you're thinking about um, the total cost over a 10, 20 year amortization period. So you're redefining in the minds of your customer what price actually is, getting them to adapt their behaviors uh, and so that you can create a more compelling proposition for them in terms of how they calculate cost and price in their business structure. Set the target related to those two things. Strategic design, I'm gonna talk about strategic design. Design the full set of solutions that are required to reach that target and then importantly communicate it and support it. And what you have done in a 10 year period of time and I really think you need to applaud yourselves and just take pause because this is a really profound thing for any industry to do. In one decade, you've been market making. You have so innovated in not only driving down operating costs, but driving down the way that people think about costs as tenants and as property owners. And innovated in the performance benefits that you communicate and help people to understand that they get out of an urban asset that you have, and you've proven that concept and you've allowed it to be measurable and transparent in such a way that you have shifted the whole price performance curve in the industry. In the commercial building industry, that curve, and we could get the data and we could run one of these curves on a computer program, that curve is fundamentally shifted. You're not outliers any longer, the curve is there. And I just really think, if you're not apply yourselves now quietly, over the beer tonight, you need to celebrate that point because people don't do that. Industries don't do that very often and it is really a profound thing. So the question now is, the big vision question, is you've done all this price performance innovation, whether it comes to what's inside the building or the envelope of the building or how the building gets its power supply and even at the eco-district scale. But if we're gonna address these global sustainability challenges, how do we scale up that practice of innovation in price performance to the scale at which we need to take it, which is the scale of the city itself or larger districts and at the scale of urban regions overall? Let's take an example of something that's always worth sort of going back and pulling up those best practices from the past and understanding them through new lenses. Let's take an example of something we widely uh, have learned about in terms of price performance innovation at metropolitan scale and ask ourselves what are the key elements that allowed that to succeed. So this is one of the five bus rapid transit corridors in Curitiba, Brazil. You've probably all heard about Curitiba, Brazil. This was done some decades ago, but you see the enormous scale of this thing. It was the invention of an entirely new category of public transit. So this allows, serves 2.5 million people in 13 municipalities, eminently scalable, um, access on 385 bus lines within 500 meters, um, 10 different types of optimized buses, their efficiency optimized to the types of routes that they're on. And it offers that for about a dollar a ride and generates an operating profit. I don't know, it may be the only public transit system in the world that generates an operating profit, okay. So what was involved in doing that? Well, first, of course, when, and I use the term strategic design to capture this because those in the design trades tend to think more about the physical design or the, the technological design. Policy design it was critical. You had to create a whole system of incentives and change planning and, and uh, building regulations in order to drive investment to these high density corridors. They had land swapping arrangements, density bonusing, so there was oodles of design in the way that the policy and development control system was arranged. You had to design these trinary road networks, so they designed a, set, a system of roads that's never been replicated anywhere with express lanes in and out, and then in the center where the, bus, where the red is there, the bus rapid transit lines uh, go, and then local traffic in between. So an entirely different structure of a road system. Product design, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they uh, innovated in 12 different types of buses from little local buses to tri-articulated buses that board like light rail vehicles and created the boarding tubes to allow them to board at the efficiency of subway stations. So you pay your ticket and you wait and you get on and off very quickly. And they invited Volvo to come to Curitiba to help them optimize the engines for these buses so that you could uh, create, as I'll show later, uh, 
a business proposition to the private bus concessions that run these lines. They would allow this to be more profitable for them. So getting the buses to be more efficient was critical from a business point of view for scaling this system. And as a result, by the way, Volvo and a number of other manufacturers come to Curitiba. It's now the third largest center of auto manufacturing in the world. So this proved to be a, an enormous industrial development strategy as well. So you see all of the different types of buses that were innovated in in order to achieve that at metro scale. And then the business model. So traditionally, Brazilian cities, Curitiba among them, uh, the bus system are run through private concessions. They're basically run by mafias. The concessioners don't stick to the route they're supposed to have. They don't maintain their buses. They don't replace their equipment. It's like a, a, a mob type situation, a corruption driven situation. How was a city to attract more than 100 bus, private bus companies to operate on these new routes? using this new equipment according to new rules of play. Well, they had to redesign the whole system, and here um, it shows uh, in the columns the, the profit and loss statement for each of those different lines. Um, such that what they did is, is rather than what they would do before is make money per passenger that they got on the bus, they made it a business arrangement with them where they would make money per kilometer that the bus ran. Right? So they changed the whole proposition and worked out the cost structure of this in such a way that there is actually an operating profit from it. So they can guarantee a per kilometer uh, profit to everyone who plays according to the rules and have a profit left over to continue to invest in and build the system. You have to innovate in communications. It's one thing to have this great system and another thing to socialize a whole new society of people on how to use this thing effectively. Core Achiever was growing at 6% population wise, growing at 6% per year for 30 years, one of the fastest growths of a city anywhere in the world in the history of the growth of cities in the world. Most of them low-income people coming from the countryside wanting to build shack favelas on the periphery. You had to socialize these people to be urban people who would use a public transit system. So they created all kinds of innovation in how you in communicate to people intuitively uh, through color coding of buildings and streets and the buses, where they are and where that fits in with the system and ultimately starting to use technology. So all kinds of innovation required there. It required institutional design. So this wouldn't have been possible if they hadn't created a new public transit company that managed that business model and brought all of those bus concessioners online. It wouldn't have worked because the mayor's only, the mayor who drove this process, the famous mayor, Jaime Lerner, uh, had term limits. He could only do four years in the office at a time. So if he didn't find a way to create institutionally uh, continuity of effort, this thing would have been four years on and then an opponent would get into office and then the thing would all collapse and then he hoped to start again. It would, never would have happened. So he creates the uh, EPUC, the City Urban Planning and Design Agency, and when he's not mayor, he becomes the president of EPUC. So for 20 years, a kind of political regime, as it were, at the local level, is in charge driving this process of innovation, critical factor of scaling up innovation. And here's the corridors today. On a market basis, right, this is a a privately based public transit system with minimal public investment. This thing has scaled to the point where it defines the structure of a whole metropolitan area of two and a half million people. So those are the elements. Those are the elements of what you could call strategic design, of what's required to do that price performance such in such a way that you can scale it up. And I talk about it in three layers. What we typically think innovation is in price performance, it's the solution. Right? So it's the product, the technology embedded within the product, the business model innovation required to support the product, and yes, some communications and user education in order to make sure that you market the product effectively and people get the benefits out of it that you promise. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. If we're going to scale from doing driving innovation at the individual asset level and take this beyond the district level to the city level to the metropolitan level, we're going to have to think about how we participate as innovators in the way that we do urban planning, in the way that the urban uh, the development approvals process happens in the city. We can't let um, the old institutional arrangements of how standards were driven 
and maintained within cities prevent us from innovating in ways that way exceed the standards for which those institutions were created. So we need to engage with the public sector to think about how we actually re-innovate and retool planning and policy making within the city. We need, may need to create development institutions that drive and risk manage that process. So if we're going to specialize in, for instance, uh, climate adaptation, we may need special purpose vehicles in cities that manage the risks related to climate uh, uh, risk, emerging climate risk in cities. Um, we're already working with insurance companies to think about insurance products that ensure the climate risks of local areas, of districts, rather than just thinking about climate risk being something that the individual building owner or householder takes on. And we'll be doing a workshop in two weeks in Toronto, actually, to look at Toronto specifically with that point of view. So you need to innovate in planning policy, institutional development, and sometimes you'll need to change the way governance happens altogether. And then ultimately there's a scaling dimension, and I use the core Chiba case because I think it highlights it very well, is there needs to be a strategic political alliance in order to take an innovation in one asset or in one precinct and make it the standard on a citywide basis. There needs to be this continuity of political support and of the powers that be in city driving that process. You may need to create some kind of specialist institution like the uh, public transit agency was created in Korachiba. And somehow you need a whole process in which you institutionalize all of these new standards and make them today's mainstream, just as LEED Gold is really becoming a kind of mainstream within the individual building industry. So the level of effort to get from the individual asset and even to the precinct, precincts are very doable these days if you have someone who owns the land or can assemble the land effectively. How do we transform a city into eco-districts where land assembly is really, really tricky? You need to work at these three levels. There needs to be an innovation process within your company. There needs to be the support within your industry to drive multiples of companies to move together, and that's what CAGBC is there for, and uh, proves the efficacy of that enabling dimension being your advocate. In the United States, the US Congress is, uh, the Republican House of Representatives is, is attacking uh, lead standards within the United States because they're being seen as sort of forcing sustainability on people. Their USGBC is very involved as a representative of the thousands who are involved in green building in the United States to ward that off. So your industry needs to be well represented. And there needs to be this sense of movement, right? There needs to be engagement with the public, awareness with the public. What you do needs to be branded and communicated in such a way that people broadly buy into it and demand that it become the standard of what their city becomes. And none of that can be done if we try to do it in the context of business as usual. Because business as usual, whether a municipality trying to do development control and planning, or whether you're a builder trying to manage the costs and the risks associated with the business process, that's a risk management process. And you can't do that scale of innovation within a risk management process. So this, I propose to you today, is one of the critical things that an association like the Green Building Council would want to think about in terms of your next dimensions of innovation beyond what you've done with buildings themselves. We need to innovate in the whole process of city building itself. There needs to be a space created between the public and the private sector and the financing sector and all of the stakeholders' communities in which we, in a risk-managed way, upstream of any individual project in which we need to perform against investor expectations or uh, uh, a P&L requirement, in which we drive the innovation process and do proof of concept of things and, and understand what is required to create the whole market ecosystem of policy and planning changes, institutional reform, governance reform, in order to make that scalable. And so we call this a strategic design process. And I posed that challenge to people at Metro Vancouver about 10 years ago, where they have the livable region strategy about driving intensification to the town centers and along corridors. And the complaint was that no one in the building industry had an interest. They were still going after green fields in Surrey and doing office parks and things like that. And the, the argument then, and I think the argument today is, you don't scale something of the ambition of a livable region strategy or sustainable region strategy without engaging and transforming the way the whole industry works and the way the whole market ecosystem works in this kind of upstream way. So we've talked about individual assets and your innovation and price performance. We've talked a little bit about district scale innovation and price performance. We've talked about regions a little bit in terms of the Korachiba case. Now the question is, 
Can cities, can urban regions ever be sustainable? Let's address the ecological footprint problem. Um, and so there's a, a group of us who have gotten together, Hans there on the left, and some other shady characters who were at that meeting in uh, 1990 at the United Nations. And we've gone back to ICLE, Local Governments for Sustainability, and are developing a partnership with five major university sustainability research centers, one of them here at Simon Fraser University, um, to look at the whole issue of how we would measure what is a sustainable state for an urban region, and to figure out what would the innovations be and the innovation process be to have an urban region like Metro Vancouver or Greater Toronto or, um, or, or Greater Montreal become a region that is a net producer of water, food, energy, and materials in order to sort of scope out the frontier of what is doable. And we think and would, we will be inviting the Green Building Councils internationally to engage with us in this exercise. So to get started, uh, Eugene Maharab, who now works at the Pembina Institute, was a postdoc student at the University of Toronto Engineering Department, and I have done some initial scenarios and number crunching just to look at how big this challenge would be, and I can just sort of present it in an in a overview way in terms of energy and food, uh, and then we'll be looking at water and materials, as I said. What would be involved in optimizing a global urban system of 7 billion people by 2050? So to do that, we need to understand, come up with some thesis about what a sustainable state would be. And here we're looking from 2010 to 2050. Um, and in this instance, with energy, uh, global demand for energy. And we set ourselves a target which we think is a sustainable target from the point of view of resource justice. So what we're saying is, is that everyone, uh, all nearly 7 billion people who live in cities, should have access to the benefits of energy, whether that's through watts or megawatts, equivalent to what an average European has today. So there's no attrition in energy, there's no, we eliminate energy poverty. There's no attrition in terms of what um, people could get in terms of benefits from energy, either through efficiency measures or through new supply. And that's 74 gigajoules per capita to provide to all people, uh, or urban dwellers, by 2050. And then we look at what we can supply from the point of view of fossil fuel generation. And this line needs to be changed. It needs to go down steeper because the flat line there was 380 parts per million. And already we're, we're in excess of that. So the thought is now for 7 billion people, we're going to rapidly drive down that line. And remember, this is on a global basis where you've got uh, a couple billion more people in China and India uh, coming into the world population. So that's why it looks level rather than steep. And within that framework, we try to close that gap through th three different strategies. The first one basically is to propose that we take the McKinsey cost curve that was already done 10 years ago. In other words, identifying everything that would be uh, a provide a return on investment in terms of energy efficiency. And we just make that mainstream. That's now the no-brainer. So within 30 or 40 years, time, can we actually do what McKinsey showed us is economically rational? That's the argument. There's no technological challenge here whatsoever. That is a policy and a market development challenge whatsoever. So that gets us a little bit of the way. And then we go to Amory Lovins and Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker in Factor 10, and we say, what if we were to innovate around taking today's best available technologies and everything related to energy and making them market viable and scaled by 2050 so that everyone is using today's best available technologies on the market by 2050. So that's the second part of the global sustainability scenario for 7 billion people living in cities around the world. Um, you know, price performance across the board and all those things to make them viable on the market. And that leaves a gap. And that gap, we argue, is what we need to figure out how to produce within our cities. So, we can, pen it, we can achieve a great part of that target by reducing energy demand, by improving technology based on what we know is technically feasible over a 40-year period of time. And now we can measure what a city has to be in order to be sustainable within that context. And the question will be for us, what are the critical areas for price, and pro price performance innovation that we'll need to do in order to achieve each of those three pillars of that strategy? If we look at developing, developed countries, sorry, OECD countries, 
uh, Canada, the US, Europe, Japan, Korea. Um, the curves will look a little different because we need to drive down the carbon content or, of our energy much more rapidly, but the three pillars of the strategy apply, and you can see that blue wedge at the top. That's what we would say is the target that cities need to achieve in terms of their own production. And now let's look at Hans and Hanover again. So here we are. We make an assumption about the first two. That's open to debate at another time. And we say that Hanover needs to generate 16 gigajoules per capita from uh, non-fossil from renewable energies by 2050. Is that doable? Can a city do that? So we go back to Hans, and he asks the question this way in his city's renewable strategy for 2050. Can an industrial city region of a million people become climate neutral and 100% renewable by 2050? What do you think? Is this a target that we as a green building movement should be striving for? in partnership with the municipal governments to do these things. Is this a realistic target? Well, let's see what Hans has come up with. So here's their strategy. And part of their strategy is to be totally non-nuclear and totally non-fossil here. So their analysis has them supplying their energy, including net of pipe and storage losses in the following ways from the following portfolio of renewables. Um, which is not just for the city of Hanover, but for the region around Hanover. So you have the agriculture region around Hanover also supplying feedstock into uh, heat production processes and things like this. And my experience with Hanover in the past is that they don't publish numbers, and with Hans in particular, they don't publish numbers if they don't see a way to do it. So this is their strategy for what they would do. And if we plug the numbers into uh, our graph from a gigajoules per capita point of view, if I can get that slide to move. Slide, please. Can you advance that slide? There we go. Okay. If we plug that number into our graph, what we find is that if they achieve that strategy by 2050, they become, in the context of that scenario, more sustainable than would even be required in our target. In other words, uh, the region of Hanover has set a target for itself by 2050 of 23 gigajoules per capita within the metro region through renewables alone. Let's look at global food sustainability in a similar way. So we set it up in a very similar way. What's our target? Seven billion city dwellers get the equivalent kilocalories per day of an average European today, which one could argue is actually too many calories for good human health. But let's give them a good European diet. Um, we at least like to go there on our holidays and eat all that cheese and drink all that wine. So it's a good, healthy diet. And at current rates of global food production, this is where the curve goes. So we have this huge gap to fill in order to create a sustainable planet by 2050 for 7 billion urban dwellers. And then we looked at the Food and Agricultural Organization international scenarios for how they're going to supply food in the future and what they think is realistic. So their scenario basically says, we'll increase cropping intensity on existing agricultural land. Um, we will increase yields on a agricultural land. So this is what, in their scientific estimate, is feasible by 2050 in their point of view. We've also um, put in a little bit there for converting a bit more land. Uh, FAO scenario fills the gap by converting forest into agricultural land. We said any protected area, any forest will not be converted. It'll just be rain-fed existing um, uh, cleared land will be converted to more farmland. Reduce agricultural waste at the uh, end consumption point. And then we need to fill that gap with urban food production. Let's look at Vancouver. So here's an urban region. Um, is this doable? So because of the agricultural land reserve and a lot of other important things in Vancouver, you have a thriving uh, agricultural sector. I think it's the fifth largest economic sector in Vancouver, uh, 2,600 farms. Uh, it exports $5 billion worth of food a year. Um, it provides one in eight metro jobs. So this is a sector worth investing in and developing it, isn't it? And it's a very diverse sector, provides the full range of foods for any diet at 3,100. Uh, that you would want in that 3,100 kilocalories a day to provide all the nutrients and protein that you would require in a diet. And if we look at what Vancouver is doing today in terms of production, they are already, you are already exceeding this target of uh, metro area food production. The challenge now becomes how to convert that into local su food supply, but we've not even scratched the surface of the technical solutions. Creating 
fractal agricultural land through these kinds of belt systems and hydroponic systems, um, fractalizing and increasing agricultural land again through high-rise agriculture. All this stuff is hardly even on the market yet. Price performance will get us there. We haven't really even thought about how to create the system of supplying uh, local restaurants, uh, local food providers, not just with um, vegetables, but you know, building up a whole regional cuisine, branding of cuisine, making this a tourist industry within the region. There's so many things in terms of regional agricultural strategy that have not been done, and yet this is eminently doable. So my argument, and I'll close with this, is that if we think at the strategic scale in terms of price performance and evaluate what the innovations we do from a price performance point of view and then tailor our innovation to create that um, uh, reduction in cost for the user while giving them more, we can more rapidly scale up the technical solutions that are widely available to us today. We can stabilize and create net productivity both in food and energy. We can exceed what, we, what Hanover and Greater Vancouver are already doing and other cities that we've done cases on. But we can only scale it up if we move beyond thinking about the product as a solution and the business model innovation by engaging with a broader community in terms of institutional development, actually radically reforming the way that planning and development approvals happen, creating special zones, special overlays that provide the incentives required, just like in Curitiba, to drive investment to certain areas in certain kinds of ways, and by building the political alliances and the public awareness in order to make this a mainstream movement type activity going forward. So we need to work at all those three dimensions, and I think that's the challenge that lies in the next 10 years for a Green Building Council uh, in Canada and anywhere in the world. These projects are already on the books. Uh, there's a port district in Rotterdam that is talking about um, moving off of fossil fuels. Um, a very interesting paper published on this called The Productive City, in fact, um, will produce 25% more energy than local demand, 3% more water than local demand, 50% more food supply than is uh, consumed locally. So we see these projects in the pipeline. China, more than 12 uh, eco-city projects, whole city regions uh, already on the books and being invested and to be developed. And the question is, will they achieve their targets? What will prove to be market viable? What will be mainstream coming out of these things in the years ahead? All I can say in closing is that we've always underestimated what was achievable. And I think if Tom, as one of the founders of Green Building, uh, here in Vancouver was asked the question back in 2000, where do you think we would be today? No one, even you, even the idealist behind this thing, would say that we would be where we are today. But let's remember, Hanover, Germany in 1950 was still a totally decimated city. In 50 years' time, they became the leader in passive housing development in Germany, and they have a renewable strategy that may actually put them on a globally sustainable footprint. Curitiba, Brazil, with that 6% uh, population growth in 1971, with the unruliness of 100 bus concessions, with no real urban planning whatsoever, managed in a 20-year period of time to create an urban region that was structured with a, 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 a transit system that offers a price performance that's not available to anywhere else in the world. So cities prove to us, just as you prove to the big ideas people what's viable, cities prove to you what is viable, and I think that your level of ambition should be guided by what it is we've seen cities do in their transformation process over the last years, and figure out how to regularize, um, manage that process of transformation, and scale it up more broadly around Kennedy. But ultimately, this will happen because you allow that inner Hans within you um, to not be complacent with your achievements of the last 10 years but to realize that you've just begun your career as optimizers and customizers and that you are still going to be the leader over the next 20 years of things that you never managed that you would be able to do in your career. And when you come back here 10 years later and have that evening drink in which you applaud yourselves, you'll get even more sauce, you'll put on more kilts, you'll sing more songs than you ever did because you had the privilege of spending 20 years of your career transforming the basic function of cities from places that were always known and understood to be a burden on the planet, that created problems for humanity, to being places that had ecological function that actually provided the solutions
for a world of people who are moving the cities. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you.